Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Poker News Podcast. This is episode number 492. I am with your brand new co-host, Jeff Platt. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm absolutely thrilled, ecstatic, all those buzzwords. I'm really happy to be here and, uh, and co-hosting the Poker News Podcast with you. Let's do it. It's so exciting. Well, I feel like it's only fair that we give the listeners and also viewers a little taste of that Jeff Platt life. So <laughs> get, tell everybody who you are. What's your story? What can we expect from you? Yeah, well, I'm sure you've heard this poker background a million times, but uh, I came up in that moneymaker boom era. Mm, I've heard of that. friends in high school watching those moneymaker episodes on the World Series of Poker, as cliche as that may sound. And then, Sarah, it, it just turned into something where, you know, I'd come out to Vegas once a year in the summer and play some smaller tournaments and try to take my shot. I've been working in, in sports broadcasting ever since I, I got out of college. And, uh, again, it, it was three tournaments every summer just because I loved the game and I loved watching it and I loved playing it with friends. Uh, in 2014, I was fortunate enough to finish well in a, in a daily deep stack and then get a good staking deal, made a, a fairly deep run in the main, got a little bit of television coverage, which is me getting in the chips bad and beating somebody else, which always makes for uh, some fantastic entertainment. Uh, and then the next year, was fortunate enough to again make a, a pretty deep run in the main, got the chips in bat again on TV, yes. did not win this time, but it was still overall a great experience. And so I would say in these last five years or so, I started to take poker um, a lot more seriously. And then, Sarah, I just had this light, uh, this light bulb moment. Okay, if I enjoy broadcasting and if I enjoy poker, let's find a way to merge the two. So here we are. You know, I've reached out to you. I'm going to do some work also with with poker productions in the summer, which I'm really excited about. And yeah, that, that's the that's the long story short of this poker and this broadcasting and how it all came together. Dude, we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting. And okay. Okay. there's plenty of sports broadcasters out there, but there's not enough great poker broadcasters. So welcome to the world. Although I will say uh, when I watched your reel and I and I saw, yeah. you know, this very serious journalism that you've been doing, <laughs> yeah. um, I couldn't wait to get you on Poker News so you could take that sports seriousness into this poker world. This is a very- okay. It's really Let's do it. It's a really it serious to. world. Yeah. Well, with all with all the drama going on, maybe it does need. You know, Mama yeah. loves that drama. That's I know you do. That's what I I'm all about. <laughs> uh, well, we got to give a shout out to our advertisers, and actually, Jeff did play on GlobalPoker.com, so I do want to ask you about that in a second, so I can get the real facts. But have you registered for the Global Poker Championships Rattlesnake Open yet? With 1.25 million in guaranteed cash prizes, a 100,000 guarantee main event, as well as huge trophies delivered to your door and other awesome giveaways you do not want to miss out. Top the Global Poker Championships leaderboard and Global Poker will, will sort travel, accommodation, and tournament buy-ins for you to represent Global Poker in a live tournament. What are you waiting for? Head to globalpoker.com and register for the Rattlesnake Open today. Did you get hooked up on this Rattlesnake Open life or like, what? what tell me about your experience. I did. You know, I, I've heard you guys talking about it um, for a while now. And so I figured, well, if I'm going to co-host the podcast, I might as well jump on Global That's Poker. that real journalism that you're already exactly. starting to showcase. Exactly. We're applying it. And I played, I fired a Rattlesnake Open event. Uh, they're they're twenty two dollar one rebuy one add on. It was really easy, and I'm not, I'm not just saying that because they're a sponsor of the podcast now. But the deposit goes through right away. You're in the action right away. I like the setup. They're they're fun looking characters. Um, it's a very easy interface to play on. I think the software is really nice. I finished third in this tournament, so I think Global Poker is now my favorite poker news podcast sponsor of all time. Yeah. The top top of the line, your first one, and you're already crushing. Uh, yeah. Your first podcast, your first global poker. I feel like poker is just really the world is opening for you right now, Jeff. Yeah, and, and it was no luck whatsoever, Sarah. Obviously, it was just my excellent play in this turbo tournament that had nothing to do with the great cards I was getting or the um, the bad beats I was able to inflict on some people. Nothing to do with that. No, I've already heard about how you get it in bad yeah. every time. 
just just getting in bad and win. Yeah, it's an easier game that way. That's what my husband always says. Got it better to be lucky than good. And I am good. True. He's lucky that he has me. That's for sure. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get into some of the news. There's been some actually interesting news going on this week. Actually, I was. Uh, you know, some weeks are more exciting than others. And this is a story I saw yesterday, maybe the day before, that Gordon Veo is suing. He filed a lawsuit in, I believe he's in San Francisco, so I think it was in San Francisco court. But basically, he's suing Poker Stars for a tournament that he won. I think it was just shy of $700,000. It was like six hundred. Actually, I'm on Forbes.com looking at this right now. Why am I not on PokerNews.com? Like, this is ridiculous. I'm going on Poker News. But um, basically, I what I understood is the gist from reading this Forbes article a couple days ago is that the... Um, Basically, that poker stars will let you play on the site, as we know, if you are outside of the United States. So there's plenty of people who are United States residents who will go, you know, to Canada for scoop or they'll go down to Costa Rica or Mexico or wherever they either have a second home or they go, you know, for big tournament series. And word on the street, though, is that or at least what what. Veo is alleging is that if an American wins one of these tournaments that in any like big sum of money that poker stars would then say, well, you actually might have been playing from the United States. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with VPNs or different things that hide your, you know, your locator. What's the what is it? Oh, oh my gosh. Anyway, I'm having a thing. But basically, if you use a VPN, it can hide your IP address. That's the word I was looking for. Sorry. That that shows where you are located. And so I guess it is possible that you could be playing from the U.S., but Veo's basically saying that if they are not going to pay, then you probably shouldn't be allowed to play in that tournament. Um, did you read this? Did you hear about this? Have you heard buzz? Yeah, yeah. I think this is – well, it creates an interesting discussion because PokerStars lays out those rules – like you said, they're very strict on using VPNs or mm-hmm. having a VPN open. And I think, hypothetically speaking, you could have a VPN open while you're in Canada, for example. Yeah. And that's still not allowed under the Poker Stars rulebook. So, to their defense, I would say that he doesn't have that much of a shot at recouping this money. However, you look at the other side of the coin and you see that poker stars has been promoting his scoop win it's it's on their blog it's on their website hey 2016 wsop main event runner-up wins almost seven hundred thousand dollars in a scoop event and you would you would think that if he did that illegally that they wouldn't be promoting it right it's wild and and basically i guess the question then becomes like how do you prove where you are gordon says that he can prove that he was in Canada for scoop. Um, I, I and honestly, I'm sure that Stars has. Um, I'm sure I, there's not a quote from them. I don't think in here, but I'm sure that they will. They will issue you know something which mm-hmm. answers to this. But I think you know, I, I don't know. I think it's really it's it's a really interesting spot, mostly because obviously the. United States government has made their feelings relatively well known about poker in the U.S. And so, you know, having to then file a lawsuit and battle it out and do this in in the United States court system is is definitely interesting. And it's going to be an interesting spot for poker stars, obviously, because they have to take this really hard stance for the federal government of the United States that right. says super clearly, like, we're not operating in, in the, the U.S., but also that, you know, I, I think that Veo claims also that he he's doing this for other people and that it's happened to other people as well. So I, this is a really interesting story. I'm going to be really interested to to see what happens. But as we all know, you know, it could be a very very long time before before this is resolved. Yeah, I, I think so. And it again, at its simplest case, Poker Stars will probably argue that he had a VPN open and then case closed. Right. right. That's that's almost all that they would need to prove. Whereas Gordon has to go about proving that he was in Canada effectively every second of every day. And even if he did that, poker stars could still say it's in our rules that you cannot use a VPN. But do we know that he was work. using a VPN? We, that's the, the buzz that I'm kind of getting is that poker stars argument is that he had a VPN open. 
again, well, you know, we don't, like you said, Sarah, we don't know what poker stars will say publicly about this. So it's hard for us to tell what their full case is. That's just kind of um, what I'm speculating. At this yeah. Point. Well, I have a VPN open a lot of the time because uh -oh. mama likes her privacy and I don't pay any, okay. I don't play any, whatever. I hope you, I hope he gets the money because I like that kid. I don't know why he's, they I mean, like he, he, won a, he won a poker tournament. It was probably in Canada for the entire time. So he probably does deserve the money. Yeah, yeah. and he probably needs it more. He has a lot of money, but, you know. That's true. Everyone needs it. Um, in other really depressing news, the Macau poker rooms and events have basically closed in the last few weeks as a result of something we mentioned a couple weeks ago on the show, the mm -hmm. Chinese poker apps, which have banned all of the social media advertising for poker in China. This is such a bummer because I've been to the the City of Dreams. I've been to the, uh, you know, the Hard Rock in Macau multiple times. It felt like this this scene was really starting to explode there. There's obviously this sort of Macanese billionaire club where there's tons of, of business professionals who like to gamble there. Tons of high stakes poker players from, from the United States have made a move over to Macau to, to facilitate this. It just, the rooms are beautiful. There's a lot. I mean, to me, I was like this China might be one of the only places where we still have a chance of just exploding this poker life out. And then no. And yeah, I don't this, understand because Chinese people love to gamble. Right, right. It it really doesn't add up. And this is a this is what you would call a bad beat. It, it kind of reminds me of a while ago in the online realm where party poker decided that you know what the laws in the U.S. Uh, we just don't think we can hang around for that much longer. And then a couple of years later, Black Friday happened and kicked out poker stars in full tilt. In this case, we're seeing some of the poker rooms in Macau say, yeah, the rules, uh, the, nothing is looking great here. We're out, but the wind's still going. The Venetian is going. The Macau Billionaire Club, like you said, is still going. This is really tough for those players who have taken up that high roller poker in Macau. Yes. On the other hand, it could really benefit rooms like the Aria and Bellagio who might start to up their high stakes cash availability. I am just trying to understand how we can reconcile this. And obviously nothing ever makes, makes logical sense in terms of what governments are doing. But sure. how can you logically reconcile that it's great to have these giant casinos with yeah. Baccarat and, and all these wild games? And that's totally cool. No one's upset <laughs> about that. But if you have, you know, these poker rooms starting to emerge, that's where we're going to draw the line. This is where things are getting a little like, come on, what is happening? Sorry, you it's, guys. It's it's that argument that we always go back to that in so many states across the country here in the U.S., lotteries are allowed. Yes. But how dare you incorporate online poker into the mix where there's a hint of skill that's required. That's yeah, it. Sure, you, you can donk off on the lottery for a K in tickets and nah, whatever. Best of luck to you. You're going to lose. Uh, if you want to play poker, no, sorry. We, we can't we can't handle that. We can't handle any incorporation of skill. The, doesn't add up. It is so crazy. And it just really chaps my, you know, or I'm sure there's a better way to say it, but yeah, <laughs> it really, it really grinds my gears. That's what I have to say. That's yeah. right. It really grinds my gears. And I have to come back to this periodically because, um, I feel like that needs to be a segment on our show because at least like once a show, there's something that just irritates me. And that's one thing. China. Okay. I really Brian enjoyed going to great. Macau. I really enjoyed your, you know, poker rooms and now it's over. And also I'm just sad to see poker stars have to, you know, the poker stars yeah. is getting a little bit of a foothold out there. And that means more tournaments, more festivals, more live poker for people. And of course I love the live poker scene. So I'm depressed. Um, we need to also talk about, this is our last sponsor with him. This is our last podcast with hymns. And I'm sad because this is one of my favorite ads, but um, Hims is a new wellness brand for men, and it's essentially for all kinds of different things to help men, but primarily focused on hair loss. And this is actually something that I've seen quite frequently. My brother, I hope you're not listening, and my brother-in-law, also I hope you're not listening, but they're losing their hair, they're young, they're handsome, you know, they're they're 
good looking guys who are worried about what comes next, what to do next. And, and it seems like the obvious response for most guys is just do nothing. Well, hymns offers this really cool opportunity to not do nothing, but also to not have to like make any really dramatic life changes. Basically, you go to four f o r h i m s dot com for hymns dot com and you can talk to real doctors who can provide medical grade solutions to treat hair loss usually they're generic you know so without getting the name brand you can get a much better deal you don't have to take any you know snake oils or crazy if you're not i mean if you're into that up to you but if not it's like this is just real stuff from real doctors to to help you guys use the science that exists to not you know, lose your hair if you don't want to, but you also don't have to go into the doctor. You don't have to sit around in the waiting room. It's easy. Answer some questions. Doctors review your stuff, give you a prescription. If you're listening, Dano, I love you, buddy. And I want you to keep your beautiful, glorious locks forever. Order now. My listeners get a free trial of hymns for just $5 today. Okay. So it's not exactly free. It's $5, but that's just shipping. You guys get it together right now while supplies last. See the website for full details. This would cost hundreds of dollars if you went to the doctor or the pharmacy. Go to four hymns.com slash poker news. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash poker news for hymns.com slash poker news and also they canceled their advertising with us because apparently we're not getting enough you know people using this and i just have to say i know that you guys are out there okay i know you're out there and you're struggling so i don't even care if we keep getting this advertising but i'm just saying i read this because i care about you and i care about your hair and just don't be don't be shy don't freak out just go for it okay I don't know if I've told you guys who our guest is this week, but I really, really enjoyed this couple. This was a really cool couple. His and Hers Poker, they have a poker podcast. Um, It's a married couple. They both have sort of regular lives, regular jobs who have become East Coast grinders. They talk a lot about strategy. They talk... I mean... Honestly, if you listen to their podcasts, I think they're hysterical. They're great. Um, Chad McVean, who's one of our listeners who we've also had on, is the one who who introduced us to them. And I, for one, think you guys are really going to enjoy this couple. Next week, we have on Jay Nandez Poker, who you guys also know is one of my favorites. Um, I just wanted to get that out there before we got too crazy. But there still is a couple of other news stories that I feel like we should cover before we get into the interview. Um, one of them being that since we've been talking about, you know, Gordon Veo trying to get his money <laughs> from stars, Neil Farrell just won his second scoop bracelet. I feel like he's been so hot for like three years now. He's been on like a solid heater live and online for ages. I think he's done a, a great job at at developing his game over the last couple of years. It seems like He's really surrounded himself with with a lot of the other high roller guys when maybe as of I don't know four years ago he was playing more than more than mid stakes tournaments but now you see him pop up in like all the 25 Ks and all the 50 Ks and he's just crushing scoop events along with that so that's uh, 220 K in the bounty event that's about 118 K or 105 K it just in bounties. Sounds like a fun tournament to play. It was a two-day tournament, and he crushed it. No real surprise here. It's, he's also just such a fun dude. I don't know. Yeah, I just love him. Yeah. He doesn't take himself too seriously. Um, in other high roller news, people who've been crushing it, Bryn Kenny won a, a big tournament in uh, the 10 k high roller in Monte Carlo. They just finished the Poker Stars in Monte Carlo Casino EPT, although when he did his interview, he did admit that it basically made it a break-even trip, which is kind of the problem with going to Monte Carlo, to be honest yeah. with you. If yeah, you, that's true. If you don't have a package, it's pretty expensive, but it was a sick final table, and uh, uh, Mustafa Kenny took second, Eric Seidel third, Dick Petrangelo, Vladimir Tarnovsky. I mean, it was, it was pretty solid, and... I mean, that's what's I think to be expected in almost all the high rollers in Monte Carlo. The main event, though, also had a super sick final table. Were you able to see any of that on the um, live stream? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool. You know, this was a stacked one also, which you don't always get for the main events. Obviously, in a high roller field, you're going to have a super sick final table. 
But to have Ole Shemion and Patrick Antonius and DP David Peters in one main event final table, that was pretty cool. That made for um, a pretty entertaining setup. And then you have somebody who qualified on Poker Stars. Sarah, I know you love these qualifying yes. stories. Where you get in for just a little bit of money, and you make a ton of money. He was in for, I think, for what five dollars, and mm-hmm. turned that into a fifth place finish. For and he was just wild, huh? Years. He was so fun and excited, and you know, sometimes you get that get qualifiers who are who are, I don't want to say wallflowers, but people who don't want to be, you know, outstanding or whatever. They're just trying to keep their game face on. And this guy was like running around, you know, hitting hitting flops, hitting rivers, like going crazy when you did. Yeah. I, I love it. We had a guy like that at the party poker event recently too, and it's like, man, I just love I love those stories. I love those And y- y'all have to look up this bluff because it's, it's everywhere and it's going to go down as one of the bluffs of the year. It's Christian Georgie, and he got – this is deep in the main event, by the way, and keep in mind that he qualified for five, five euros or so. He gets all the chips in with seven deuce on the turn, and the, the board's queen, ten, nine, four. And this guy just shoves with seven deuce, and it worked. He got somebody to fold ace king with an ace high flush draw. It was amazing. He was ecstatic. That is a must-watch video. And again, Sarah, that by the end of the year, that could go down as bluff of the year. I mean – like in the words of my boy Tony G, you know, you gotta have the hat and commitment. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't have the heart and commitment, you can't make it. I love it. Well, let's. I think that covers it for most of the important stuff. We'll throw to a couple stories before we wrap it out. But in the meantime, let's just welcome onto the show Matt and Tracy Walt of His and Hers Poker dot com. We are joined by His and Hers Poker. Now, we have heard a lot about you guys already. I've been doing a lot of research. I think the the concept is fantastic. Matt and Tracy Walt, this is a a really cool, interesting idea, and I think you're really touching on something that a lot of poker players are looking for right now, which is hand analysis. (laughs) It seems crazy, but I think this is why the vlogs are taking off like crazy. It's why people are looking for more podcasts. I think, I think people are really interested in just hearing other people's perspective on hands in order to get better. So before we get too crazy though, and and get all into it, I just wanted to to throw it out there. Welcome to the show. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you very much for having us on. It's a real honor. So I want to start off also just, Jeff, we will have already started the show, so everyone will already know who you are, but for oh those who are only joining on video, this is Jeff Platt, the <laughs> new co-host of the Poker News Podcast, and also he'll be doing a ton of video stuff you guys get used to seeing his face. I'm also happy to be here along with his and hers poker. I think everybody's just happy to be here yeah, chatting it's, about yeah. the game we know and love. It's glorious, and it's a miracle that you know I'm keeping it sober here because it's 6 p.m. where I am. It's it's way past happy hour, but for you guys, <laughs> I keep my game face on. I keep it straight. So for those who don't know, so His and Hers Poker is a podcast. They've got a website going, and basically – you guys have a lot of different segments and kind of fun things going on, but the basic gist is that you both pick a couple of hands from, from I think, games that I at least could relate to. Some one, two, some one, three, mostly two, five. I'm like a, you know, one, two girl. So it's nice to kind of hear it's not these crazy levels, but you guys go through these hands, you talk out kind of different perspectives mm-hmm. as men and women. And I think Last show, we spoke about this woman who was dressing up. She just wrote a book, Dressing Up as a Man and Playing Poker, and sort of mm-hmm. her experience of both. And I think uh, we had Christy B on, a vlogger, who's been talking a lot about, you know, dressing different and seeing how, you know, that image affects her. But also, like, men and women just think differently. So I think I think this is such a cool concept. And let's just start with with how this idea sort of birthed for you guys. Absolutely. So we actually started listening to a lot of podcasts, uh, like some of the ones that you're discussing, and the ones that we gravitated more towards were definitely the ones that did more hand analysis. And I mean, it's it's fun to listen to stuff related to poker that talk about kind of living the poker life and being a crazy degen gambler, that can be fun and sexy <laughs> and interesting and make for a fun car ride. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I wanted to learn more about 
getting better at poker. And when it comes right down to it, what makes for the best teaching tool for that kind of uh, for that kind of learning, gaining that kind of experience quickly is listening to something where you're doing hand analysis. Yeah, and so I'll chime in here too. So we basically would do this without a podcast anyway. It would start around our dining room table when we weren't even playing in a casino. And we would just sit there and deal out cards and pretend to be different players and talk about how we'd make decisions. And when we were both playing live, then we'd have an hour to drive home from the Borgata. And we'd be like, okay, I played this hand. Here it is. Wait, I noted it down on my phone. And so it started really organically. And Matt finally said one day, why don't we do a podcast? Because we do this anyway. So that's really where it came from. It makes so much sense. And I was sort of reading you guys just your about us uh, on your website today. And I think it's, I think that's another important thing. Tracy, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you guys both realized that you love poker? Yeah, I will tell you, if you'd asked me five years ago if poker was going to be a passion of mine, I would have been like, uh, I don't think that ever is going to happen. I, I really, for the longest time, was convinced that it was gambling, but yet I didn't mind Matt doing it because I knew he took it seriously. But he was really sneaky, and he got me, um, he got me hooked from watching old episodes of Poker After Dark. And I just, I first, I liked the characters, you know, you got like Phil Hellmuth on there and I love Phil Locke. He always cracked me up. And then I started paying attention and saying, wait, um, you know, this guy's got this and the flop looks like that. Why is he doing this? And it, it got to the point where I finally, I was like, Matt, okay, give me your poker one-on-one -on -one lesson and let's go from there. And I was hooked after that and it was you know some nerves in the beginning and eventually he got me to play live and I have never looked back and so Tracy that that's kind of how how your game developed Matt how would mm -hmm. you say your game got to a point where it is now you're you're kind of the pre-money maker boom right maybe rounders yeah. started to spark your interest yeah absolutely yeah a very <laughs> uh, very good guess uh, that is that is indeed the the moment that changed everything for me I mean I grew up Actually, we both did in families that love playing games mm -hmm. and particularly like complicated strategy games. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to college, I was already playing things like, uh, you know, Pinochle. Uh, uh, I learned how to play bridge at college. Yeah. I had already played like Magic the Gathering was huge at that point. <laughs> um, and you know, other strategy games like I was a big Dungeons and Dragons nerd, actually still am, you know, yeah, when it comes right down to it. He still plays in the game now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's but, nothing more than a, you know, really in-depth strategy game. So, you know, I, I knew I liked that kind of stuff and that's the way my mind worked. And when I got to college, I definitely got plugged in with a bunch of uh, other kids who were into the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then, as you just predicted, one day in 1999, <laughs> I guess, we watched Rounders. And after that point, no more bridge, no more pew knuckle, no more nothing. Poker 24-7. And pretty much from the very night we watched Rounders. And it got to the point where we were, uh, one of the guys who I was good friends with in that poker group was a member of a fraternity. And later that year, his frat was hosting tournaments on our dorm hall and getting all kinds of, I mean, we'd have like 50 people show up for our poker tournaments. We were running the racket right there at college. It was great. And of course, now, like you said, this is pre-moneymaker. And so <laughs> nobody knew what they were doing at that point, and least of all us. So we were all terrible. Uh, we, we thought we were going to be the next uh, Mike McDermott <laughs> from Rounders, obviously. But uh, n none of us were qualified, except for one guy who actually, we found out he was bad the first year. Then the next year, junior year, he came back and suddenly started taking all of our money. And we discovered that he had, over the summer, taken the money that he'd earned from his summer job and gone and played in a bunch of underground games in Buffalo, New York. And so he was sharking us all when he came back. So <laughs> I don't that, think I ever heard that part before. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I didn't want to tell you I'd lost all that money. Yeah, right. Um, it's, it sounds like there are many uh, rounders elements to your story. You're missing yeah. class to go play poker. You're being conned by sharks. I love it. You have the, yeah. so. And it gets, even, uh, it gets even more beyond that. So then I went to law school after college. And 
because of that, I really didn't. Now, I didn't drop out of law school uh, <laughs> to go play poker or anything, but uh, I did skip the occasional class to go play okay. poker, I will say, because <laughs> uh, at that point, the Borgata had just opened up. I went mm-hmm. to a law school at Rutgers here in New Jersey. And so if I didn't have classes or I had one I didn't really feel like going to that day, sometimes I would go down and play one of the like weekly $60 daily tournaments at the Borgata. Mm-hmm. And mostly I was just playing um, uh, tournaments at that point. I knew I didn't even have a, the bankroll to play even one, two at that point. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so uh, mostly constrained myself to tournaments. And uh, I knew I was not a great player. I knew it was an overall losing player, but I was just playing for fun at that point. And so I really didn't decide to get serious about poker until actually after we were married. Mm -hmm. And I I can't say what actually sparked it. Maybe it was just having some free time. Uh, I was at a law firm that I had uh, been at for quite a while and kind of got settled there. Mm -hmm. And we just bought a house and we were settled here in South Jersey. And I was like, you know what? I haven't been in forever. Why don't I just give poker a try again? And I went down and I was like, and I got cleaned out again. I'm just like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I want to get good at this game. Yeah. And by this, by this point, it's like, this is three, four years ago. And so by this point, there's all kinds of books and stuff, obviously mm-hmm. written so much material on the internet. Mm-hmm. And so it was really easy to just, I went on Amazon, I got a list of the top 10 poker books mm-hmm. on there and I just bought them and read them all. And I found two things. One, I loved it. <laughs> And two, I've been playing like an absolute donkey for my entire life. So, but that's okay. <laughs> Realizing that is the first step to a cure, right? So, and you're such a- an attorney too, though. I love it. He's like, I went top ten books. I read every single one of them, <laughs> and I can tell you, you know, what's what's the case law on this spot? I know exactly what we need to do here. <laughs> yes, you can tell I like re- doing research. Yeah, it's it's fun. Trust me. So. Uh, And so that's about the time when I started watching poker videos at home and I did, I will admit, pull sneaky action and put some of them up (laughs) on the TV when I knew that Tracy would be in the room reading a book, uh, crocheting something. And I didn't say, hey, watch this. I'm trying to con you into playing poker. But I knew (laughs) on the weekends we were playing these strategy games that take six hours to play. Like we play one that simulates (laughs) the entire Cold War using cards and tokens and stuff. And it takes an entire day to play. Well, if you like that, and she was a math major in college, uh, that game is called Twilight Struggle. Uh, it's like, by the way, he'd husband. always mm-hmm. yeah, he'd always play uh, the U.S. and I'd always play Russia. So <laughs> I don't know what that says about us, but <laughs> I mean that you guys are different, and that's good. I think <laughs> two, two perspectives. <laughs> so uh, I I knew, and she was a math major in college, so I I absolutely knew that she would be fabulous at poker. Uh, all she needed was the to recognize it is not gambling, but it's a strategy. Game. The initial fix. You had to just give her a little taste so she could come back. We do it. That's how we do it. You want to, you want to kind of take it from there, dear, and our, yeah, how so, we got here? So we, so he got me hooked basically through that. And, um, but I'm, I'm kind of like an anxious person at heart. So it did take a lot of warming up to finally get me to play live. Um, but, but what did it was, um, he hooked me up with uh, playing online tournaments on Poker Stars because we can do that in Jersey. And that just got me really comfortable with like seeing hands, a lot of hands, and being able to kind of like learn how to make quick decisions instead of like belaboring them like we do practicing around the dining room table. And finally, um, you know, one weekend, I think it was like in the fall or, or late summer or something, we finally got down to the Borgata and I sat down at a one, two table and ripped the bandaid off. And I was so nervous and I, I did okay. Like I did really well. Like I didn't, um, like a lot of people, you know, who first start playing, they've got like tells out the wazoo. I had practiced like just, you know, maintaining a pose and like doing the same thing over and over again, you know? And, but just by the end of the night though, I, I think on the car, I broke down crying because I was so nervous yeah, the whole time that I, I bottled it up the entire day. 
and it just had to get released. <laughs> But it's interesting. It shows how you both take it so seriously. Cause even I think the first time that I played, I was so nervous. I was shaking. I mean, the Mm -hmm. first time I played live, but then I was just like, Oh, like give me a wine and try. Like I, (laughs) I I think I was so worried about being nervous that I was less, you know, focused on actually, it's Mm -hmm. really clear that you were like, okay, I know how to do this. I practice doing this. I want to play good poker. That's what I care about. Definitely a bit of a perfectionist as Matt would say. So uh, usually if somebody is going to beat me up, it's going to be me first. Yeah. So I really wanted, I really wanted to do it well. Like I really wanted to play well. So, so, so from that point <laughs> on, we would obviously go down together all the time to the Borgata and on the car rides home, we would bring each other hands mm-hmm. that we wanted to discuss, say, what do you think I did here right or wrong? Or how would you have played this differently? And then at one point, not too long after that, after Tracy had uh, stepped up to two five, mm-hmm. about not too long into your your poker career, I'd say, dear, right? Maybe just about six months or no, something. No, it got to the point where a lot of the stuff that we were kind of studying in our off the table time, uh, I couldn't really utilize fully at one two, and there were just you know because I know you you guys have listened a little little bit to the podcast, like we'll talk about like, you know, trying to bluff somebody here or there. You can't do that quite as often at one, two as you can at two, five, like you can, because people pay attention more at two, five. So I I was learning all this stuff and I was just like, when am I going to be able to do this? And, you know, (laughs) so finally, you know, I, I made, I made the leap and uh, joined Matt there. How would you compare that first time playing live to the first time moving up to two five? I think I definitely wasn't as nervous, but I knew that the competition was going to be a step up. And I will say like in retrospect that that's still true, but now I look back and I'm like, you know what? There's are still, there are still fish at the two five table. That's and true. You know, I think it's just helpful, you know, being basically a rag down there, you know, all the familiar faces and you get used to how people play. And now I can sit down in the table and go, man, this table is rag heavy. I don't want to be here all night. You know, I'm going to table change or something like that. Or if you sit down and you see a bunch of new faces, you're like, all right, this table might be great. Like, you know, (laughs) let's see how these people play and like how willing to give their money away they are. So but it was, it was a little, I was a little nervous the first time stepping up, but um, it was like a Friday night. So we, we didn't get down there until after work. So I only had to kind of like push through for a few hours and, and that was enough to kind of like get me through the nerves. Well, Sarah mentioned this at the beginning, but I feel like we have a lot of listeners who are at that two, five level, or maybe mm-hmm. trying to jump from one, two to two, five. Maybe this question's a little better suited for Matt just because you've been playing 2-5 for a little bit longer. But how have you seen that that level of stakes change or maybe evolve over the last, I don't know, four or five years or so? I think there it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think that overall at the 2-5 level, it is more competitive. Mm-hmm. Um than I think it used to be, let's say, during the real height of the moneymaker uh, boom era. Um, but I also think that as time has gone by, too, there have been some people who have just been playing 1-2 for a very long time, who I know I remember seeing as regs at the Borgata even X number of years ago, before I started getting serious about the game, who now are playing 2-5. and quite honestly, a lot of them probably shouldn't be. And I think they just got tired of being like, you know, oh, I, I know enough. I've been playing here for forever. I screw these one, two donkeys. I'm going to go play the real game at two, five. And, uh, and yeah, I, there's, you know, bad, bad reg is a term for a reason. And there's, uh, there, there's definitely some folks have made the step up that maybe that maybe shouldn't have. So uh, there's there's both elements to it. I I will say, however, I do feel having played in different spots that uh, the the scene in New Jersey is tough. Um, yeah. And I've heard that from people who have come and visited. Uh, we I mean we play both at 
we play on the Borgata on weekends. And if we play during the week, we play at parks outside of Philly uh, because that's closer to our office. Um, and I would say that both of those places are fairly tough. Mm -hmm. And I've had people visit both of them from out of the state when they come in for, let's say, the Borgata Spring Open that just ended. Mm -hmm. And they say, man, playing the cash games here is they're pretty tough competition. Yeah. So, but that's good. I like that. That means that if we can, uh, you know, like the old song says, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> yes. uh, that was uh, speaking about New York, but, but it's mostly New Yorkers in the room anyway. That's, so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it what fits. I was going to say. It it's a lot of New Yorkers that come down for the weekend, or sometimes they'll come down for, you know, multiple days, like week into the weekend. And, you know, they're also playing home games up there, which you know, I've never played one because we're down here. But, you know, I hear those are really tough. So they're they're bringing that experience with them when they come down and they play in New Jersey for the weekend. And that's another thing, too. I will say you do get a lot of folks who do play in these underground games in New York. And to them, 2-5 is a joke. Uh, so they are <laughs> not afraid to just come put a thousand bucks down on the table and just punt it without thinking because Love those people, God bless them. Mm -hmm. God bless them. <laughs> and that's a, I mean, that's a function of like playing in those crazy home games yeah. that have um, uh, different economics to them from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And also probably because, you know, a big Mac probably costs $15 in Manhattan. It's just, you know, the money, <laughs> the money just isn't as meaningful. So yeah. <laughs> that's a interesting uh, component of uh, AC economics. So you don't play though as much, you mentioned, you know, practicing some of this stuff before you were playing live mm -hmm. online, but how do you guys, you are clearly more interested in playing live. Yes. So I think that, um, once, once we got into a routine of, you know, going, going down on the weekends, trying to go during the week, sometimes it kind of got to be like, well, we have other things going on in our lives. Cause you know, we both got day jobs and, you know, we're, we're involved in some other, you know, friends, family, church stuff. And so basically like, you know, the cleaning's got to get done sometime, <laughs> you know, the grocery shopping's got to get done sometime. And, and so like, you know, those nights when we'd be home, like that time gets used for something else or sometimes just poker study. Um, we do still do that a lot. Like, uh, so this, this is a glue and uh, um, a view into domestic life. There are times when I'll be like, Matt, I got to put the laundry away. I'm like, why don't you come in and we'll do Jonathan little practice problems. And so, <laughs> so he'll, sit, he'll sit on the bed and I'm like full laundry and putting things away. And he's like, all right, you know, uh, Jonathan raises from under the gun with blah, blah, blah. And we'll just like go through and talk about it while I'm doing domestic stuff. Yep. This is so, literally like every man's fantasy <laughs> life I, you I, just described. That sounds amazing. <laughs> it is no that surprise. I have the best wife on planet Earth, <laughs> and I know it. I am blessed beyond belief. <laughs> so how do you guys find time? I mean, at first I was going to say, do you still study? Because obviously having regular jobs, playing on the weekends. How do you also then find time? How do you work the, the podcast into, into your schedule? And has it sort of become part of your, I guess, study life too? You could double dip there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, what we do is we will take notes while we're at the table if we think we had a hand that would be good to discuss on the podcast. Uh, I, I just do it on my phone. Tracy actually takes a notebook with her now and, yeah. and takes notes which has been, that, that in That's itself awesome. has been a really good study tool because uh, she can exchange that with me during the mm -hmm. week and I'll take a look at her notes. And even if we don't feature a hand on the podcast, I can like make little comments back and say, you know, here's, here's what I think about this spot, et cetera, et cetera. And that's um, great. yeah, that, that's been great. Yeah. So on Sunday, then we, we play on Friday and Saturday down in AC. And then on Sunday, we will record the podcast and then uh, usually on uh, Monday uh, when I'm not a special guest star on, uh, on another <laughs> podcast, <laughs> I uh, gladly giving up my editing tonight to join you folks. And uh, so uh, either on Monday or Tuesday, I'll do the editing. Yeah. That's just become a, a normal part of life now, but, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, it has been fabulous. Yeah. I've looked at my 
records and Tracy's records, you know, on our little poker tracker on the phone for our, um, you know, keep track of our, our income numbers. And it has had a dramatic shift upwards in the last six months since we've been doing this podcast. And it's I think, been great. yeah, yeah, just that, that has to be correlating there. Mm -hmm. And it's just, the more you talk about hands like this and the more you right. get into deep analysis of them, uh, the more study you do away from the table, it's going to improve your win rate. And I, I know that just before driving back in the car and talking about <laughs> these hands is one thing. Now, having to justify our decisions to our audience is yet another thing, and it's, and it's great. So you've reached this point where you're discussing two five hands on your podcast, but as we all know, poker's not a simple game, to say the least. There's very rarely a time where you can say, oh, this is the 100% correct answer. So what, what kind of challenges or maybe how do you deal with that kind of a challenge when it comes to discussing strategy on this kind of platform? Well, I know that, um, you know, we're, we're very aware of um, the idea of like there's GTO out there and there's exploitative play. And I think most of the time, um, the way we kind of approach, uh, you know, this question here is just thinking about the fact that a lot of the times down at the Borgata, we're going to be using more exploitative moves and play. And so we really are approaching every situation as a unique situation. Um, there, there have been times where, um, you know, we'll be talking to one another and say, now, my first instinct here is to do this. But after I thought about this player, the situation, their tendencies, my, you know, my image at the table, I actually ended up doing the opposite. And so um, that's kind of how we try to approach it. And we do sometimes get into, you know, talking about like, well, would we need to balance this here against this particular player? Um, that kind of stuff. But but mostly it's really trying to figure out what the best decision is for this specific situation. Yeah, I think one of the strengths of our podcast that we try to fit a niche role is to discuss primarily exploitative play for the 2-5 and 1-2 levels. Uh, we do discuss a bit of deeper analytical, strategic, game theory optimal play a little bit <laughs> um kind of is like a proof of concept for like okay so here's the action that we took here's sort of the exploitative reason for it now let's see if this is actually a solid balance play overall to incorporate into your game uh, but definitely you know there there are a lot of resources out there put out by nosebleed stakes pros playing against other nosebleed stakes pros and that's good and that's a good foundation for learning really solid uh gto optimal play but is that really going to help you out playing against some drunk 60 year old guy <laughs> with tattoos and a muscle shirt from New York at the Borgata? No, like not really. <laughs> yeah, there, there you have to go to uh, uh, a next level about you know, reading that guy's tendencies, <laughs> realizing how he is incredibly unbalanced in his play, and then thinking about how you're going to go ahead and exploit that. So that really nitty gritty in the streets mm -hmm. kind of exploitative uh, strategy. Nice. Yeah, real life yeah. play, real life play. <laughs> Not playing against one computer against another computer. That that's what we do on, on our podcast. I I totally love it, and especially I think for I guess for our audience who hasn't heard your guys' podcast yet, um, talk to tell I guess just tell them a little bit about some of the segments and some of the things that that you guys do and what they can expect to hear once they yes. see which they're all going to. Yeah. So. Um, the the one thing we did cover is we do um we each pick a hand that uh you know like one i played one matt matt's played um so that we can critique the other one so we do hand analysis and we take turns with those but then Wait, very and before early you go on i want to ask this really quick because as someone who asks people to do hand analysis pretty regularly <laughs> i'm always 
interested in how they choose the hands. You know, sometimes players come to me and the, it'll be a hand where they lose and other ones it's this, you know, six spot where they bluffed or whatever. Like, how are you guys picking your hands? Oh, I'm, I'm very glad you asked that. Yeah, because I know I've read some books and listened to some other material where you can kind of safely assume that the author has put this in because every decision that they, yeah. exactly, the thumbs up, every decision that they made is going to be solid gold, right? That is not our podcast. <laughs> Often we will bring hands because like, like I said, it started us just talking to each other and saying, how do you mm-hmm. think I played this? So Oftentimes it will be, I want to talk about this hand because I don't know if I played it right. So now, of course, yeah, some spots it is, uh, the episodes where we want to do more teaching. And like this last week, I had a hand that really illustrated one specific point I wanted to get across and teach. And so I used that hand because it was illustrative of that. Mm-hmm. And I thought that, you know, I played it correctly to illustrate that point. But certainly we've brought other hands on where, and we're very comfortable. And, yeah. and we encourage our viewers to, hey, cut up our play if, <laughs> if you don't agree with what we did. Uh, you know, t- tell us that you think we should have taken a different line here. Because that, that's what we're doing ourselves on our podcast. Yeah. And you guys encourage your viewers to also, or your listeners rather, to send in hands themselves if they would want to. Yeah, I mean, we're we're still kind of getting off the ground, but um, we had one that I got from one of our friends down at the Borgata, and then we are going to be doing another listener hand shortly that did get um, submitted uh, to us through, uh, I think, email. So that's, you know, that's kind of exciting. We're looking forward to doing that. Um, but we also, um, in the podcast, we want to also kind of open it up to people who are just getting into poker and... Uh, Because, like, let's be honest, like, a lot of the first people that we said, please listen to our podcast were, like, people we worked with, our family, our friends. Like, some of these people, you know, they they know what a straight is, but, like, you know, that's that's beyond, everything else is way beyond them. So, um, we started doing some segments. Um, The one that Matt does is Nuts and Bolts. And he's kind of gone through, like, all right, it's your first time sitting at a poker table. What do you got to know? And it's kind of built built on from there. And that's really geared towards people who are just wanting to like learn about the game. They can listen to that segment. It's not like really nitty gritty, but it's enough of an overview is that now they can go off and they can start doing some homework and some study and they at least have the general concept. But you guys um, are out there evangelizing for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we like it. Um my my favorite segment, which we don't do every time, but I, I like it because I think it can be kind of fun and quirky, is our two chips. And that's that's where we kind of are like, okay, you know, here's what happened this week. You know, parks opened their new room. What do you think about it? And uh, you know, I got to visit like Maryland Live once and I'd never been there before. So I got to put my little spin on that and and you, you know. guys did one about a, a TV show that has like a poker player on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's what I was listening to this morning. And I, it was, it was great <laughs> because I, I'd never seen it, but it is so funny as a poker player. Sometimes when you see these shows and you're like, oh my gosh, this, these things, this is how people <laughs> see it. Like hire us. We'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They could, they could absolutely, like we said, uh, you use a poker consultant on the show. <laughs> it, it makes you wonder what some of these television shows are getting wrong in like other specialty areas that Holy. you don't spot. Yeah. And Holy. I will say it at least give Tracy uh, an opportunity to like gripe about something like that, that they're getting wrong on a TV show. Besides what I normally do on a, on a cop show like that is gripe about the, the courtroom scenes I, right. she has to put up with me when I say, oh, they, this, the other attorney should be objecting here. This guy's obviously making a leading question. She just throws a pillow at me and says, yeah. shut up, shut up. That's Trying definitely to happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, so interesting we, too, this, this attorney thing. I feel like there's clearly some correlation. There's, there seems, it's like, I think stockbrokers are sort of traders and attorneys. These are the most common I guess trades that end up being attracted to poker from my experience, from what I've seen. I, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. I've met a lot of attorneys down there and, and one more to add to the list is just entrepreneurs in general, or small business owners yeah. is, yeah, I think if you, you have to have the drive to 
succeed on your own. You know, mm -hmm. no one's going to push you to, to get better at poker. You got to want to do the work on your own. And so anyone who has that kind of entrepreneurial spirit, I think is, yeah, is, is shifting towards it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but being close to New York, we definitely get a lot of traders. Oh, yeah. uh, right. And these days we have, I not one this last week, but two, uh, crazy crypto kids at my table this yeah. last week who were like 22 years old and they're like they're like yeah i'm just uh this a thousand dollars is like uh 0. 0.05 doge coins or whatever so this is nothing to me just here spending my my crypto bucks you're but, like welcome i'll take it Thank uh, you. yes absolutely <laughs> gladly because i don't have any yeah i didn't even know what it was until all these people started showing up and dumping their uh, their bitcoins to me at the table so yes <laughs> indeed welcome welcome <laughs> i think it's something I, I was thinking about and i think this is jeff knows i've let jeff know very clearly that i don't take constructive criticism very well oh, it's something yeah. i've been working on for a long time in my life and i let people know right from the get just you know in case i get a little defensive or sensitive <laughs> on them and i think actually my husband is the person who i'm the least receptive to the <laughs> the criticisms and we definitely when we would talk hands um you know after tournaments or after playing cash i i think it, it caused some it caused some real drama so you guys mm -hmm. that's just not that that doesn't happen with you guys it's okay to just say no you shouldn't have played it like that that was stupid well not usually but there have been moments and i i think we both have actually like felt that where where we were just kind of like we took something a little too personally but we try to we try to keep that out of the podcast <laughs> and we try not to do it anyway but you know sometimes it's sometimes it's hard to to think like you know I thought I played this spot really well and then another person's like no it was like the worst decision ever <laughs> you know <laughs> ever not yeah, love ever ever, ever. <laughs> Like, or at least that's what it sounds like when you're hearing it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's interesting. You said that, Sarah, about like not taking constructive criticism. Well, that when I was in grade school and they didn't <laughs> quite give you grades yet, uh, you know, they gave you the report cards that just said like the needs improvement. That's always the one I got the N for needs improvement on. It's <laughs> ne it never takes constructive criticism. You're like, and I'm so, pissed and, about it, by the way. Very yeah. pissed. <laughs> yeah. And don't put it on my report card because I don't want to hear the criticism. Yeah. yeah. So, oh so the constructive criticism that I get from my fiance when I bust a tournament <laughs> is well, why did you have to put every single chip in the middle? Why couldn't you have saved one? So that's about all she has to offer. So I certainly appreciate the discussions that you guys uh, actually have. And I wondered, I was just curious if we could get, you know, kind of a sneak peek into the, the strategy talk. I want to throw a question out there that I think would help a lot of our listeners, Sarah, who I also think are tournament players who do mix in the occasional cash mm -hmm. game here and there. What would you guys say the biggest mistake you see in tournament players who are approaching cash games who are maybe sitting down to play two five at the Borgata after they bust a tournament. Yeah. Yeah. I, we actually had a, quite a few episodes over the last few weeks and we discussed just this topic because the, again, this Borgata spring open was in town. Uh, the Borgata. You say the circus comes to town. The circus right? yeah. was in town. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is a circus. The room is like three times as full as normal. Mm -hmm. And it's great. It's great. And just to see, just to one, see that just poker is alive and well. And mm -hmm. all these, they're young kids too, who are coming and doing the tournament circuit. It's great to see for the health of the game. But yeah, I would say the, one of the biggest adjustments that they do not make correctly is they buy in for a short stack because they're more comfortable with that coming from a tournament setting. And so I always will advocate playing cash, buying in for as much of a stake as you're comfortable with. We always buy in for tournament maximum, uh, I'm sorry, for, for table maximum. When I teach people the game, that's, I encourage them not to play unless they have the bankroll to buy in for the maximum. Mm -hmm. It just gives you more maneuverability. And if you have that skill set from playing cash and being more comfortable playing more deep stacks, it does give you a huge advantage. And so that knowing how to play more deep stacked is the key component, I would say. And what goes along with that is I think because they're used to more short stack situations and more pre-flop and flop decisions and not as many turn and river decisions, the tournament players 
tend to play faster, both pre-flop and flop also. And yep. so that is, a, I feel, a major uh, exploitative factor that we cash game mm-hmm. players can use when we know that a tournament player is sitting down and they're like, hey, I just busted out of the tournament. I'm like, well, you're going to play top pair really fast then. I can pretty much make that assumption eh? until I see otherwise. Yeah. And I'd say one way you could kind of sum that up to or, or just kind of twist it around is to say um, if it's the particular um, tournament player who maybe he doesn't buy in and have a short stack, but he does buy in for the full amount, he'll still play it like a short stack a lot of the time. And that kind of, you know, envelops those tendencies that Matt was just mentioning. You guys have been so amazing. Like we are already 10 minutes over. I literally, just so you guys know, I literally just paid money to upgrade my Zoom account (laughs) so that I didn't cut this conversation off. You guys have been so awesome. And I have like a million more questions, actually. I still want to ask you, but for for all of our listeners, for those out there who've missed it, T- tell us where they can find your podcast. What's the easiest ways to to get a hold of you guys and to 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 get in on this action? If you guys if you guys love this Matt and Tracy action, you don't want to. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you again. And yeah, you can find us uh, on hisandherspoker.com is our website. Uh, we're on Twitter at his and hers poker, Facebook his and hers poker. Uh, I think that's about it. There, our podcast is uh, it's free. It's weekly. You can find it on iTunes. Uh, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you download your podcasts, we're there. Uh, basically, wherever you, you found the Poker News Podcast, we'll be there too. And uh, come join us. We're uh, thinking uh, in the future about adding, continuing to add features uh, to our podcast, mm-hmm. not only for the weekly broadcast, but some more content that we're going to put on the website as well. Uh, we're discussing right now launching um, some kind of incentive program for regular listeners on the mm-hmm. website with some more content things relating to submitting us hands and us being able to send you feedback. So uh, yeah, come follow us and uh, join us on this journey. I mean, uh, we're, we're very honest that uh, we're, we're just, we're on our poker journey uh, together and with our listeners also Uh, we continue to learn week by week. And I think that's the best attitude to have in poker is just, wanting to continue to learn and we love to receive feedback from our listeners again even if they say oh i would have played that differently great we want to hear that so come on and tell us and if i'm allowed to tease it too uh so matt just started working on a project that um hopefully by the end of the year will be put together um so he's he's putting together basically like uh, a book Doing, I was literally just going to say, I know yeah. you wrote a book, Boo, and I feel like this is like a, <laughs> yes. a book in the making. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so he started going back, um, starting with episode one and the hands we did on it, and he's going to go into more in-depth analysis and write, you know, write that up. And then um, by the end of the year, it'll just be like one big compilation of approximately 100 hands, I guess. And, um, you know, and that might actually get worked into whatever kind of program we end up doing for for regular listeners as well yeah i started writing a little bit of that and i'm really looking forward to it because it allows me to dive even deeper into the strategy uh, of each of the hands mm-hmm. and you know sometimes on the podcast we'll say oh you could take this line or you could have taken that line and i can see both aspects and you know that's sort of because you can't go while we're sitting there doing the podcast into some of the deeper math behind some of the decisions but being able to do that in the book, I get to be able to do that, which is, uh, I, I like that even yeah. better. And that's something more to give our, our listeners also. So, And it's palatable, or at least that's what it feels like to me. Mm-hmm. As someone who's on the circuit a lot and like you're talking about, I deal with tons of high rollers. I love hearing how they're thinking about things. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. But to me, it's just not, I'm not listening to that and thinking, oh yes, I can't wait to work this into my game. Like, <laughs> but yeah. it's, and especially you two both coming from, uh, you know, the, this man woman life and playing regularly now in 2018, you mm-hmm. know, you go buy the 10 books in the beginning and you can get some great fundamentals from <laughs> what was going down in 1996. But, you know, I, I think this is, this is a really, I'm actually shocked, I guess that this sort of, I don't want to say niche or shtick or like the um, man and woman couple doing this, like how <laughs> has this not been done already? This is, it seems like such a no brainer to me. Yeah, it's a lot of fun too. Yeah, well, I mean, we, uh, and, and one of the things we talk about on the podcast is definitely how you can uh, speak with your significant other about huh, 
the poker, <laughs> the poker lifestyle. And yeah. I know we've talked to a lot of people at the table who I'm, you know, I'm sure this is no surprise who are, <laughs> you know, mostly eight out of 10 men, you know, I'd say that's yeah. the, the demographic, right? And they say, you know, oh, I don't think my wife or girlfriend or whatever would ever play poker. And I'm like, well, why not? Yeah, get her <laughs> why up not? here. Like, <laughs> Do you respect her? Is she intelligent? Yeah. Like, let uh, her in on it. And it's the exactly. same for me. My husband's who got me into poker. And you're right. It's like planting these little seeds like, oh, no, it's fine. Do whatever you're doing. But isn't this like psychological moment yeah. going on up there? Very interesting. And then you're like, yes. <laughs> like, you don't have to get her with the math. We're going to get your we're going to get Mrs. Future Mrs. Platt, Jeff. She's coming. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I think old episodes of Poker After Dark and then That's episode dark. one of his and hers podcast. Yes. Goes in there, yes. And nice. then she'll be good to go. She'll have a little more advanced questions. Oh my gosh. I, I like love it. it. I like it. I love it. Well, thank you guys so much. You really were just such a pleasure. Honestly, I was like, I told my father and I'm going to cook dinner at 6 30 and I just couldn't, I still have more questions. So I hope we can get you guys on the show again. At Absolutely. Some point. Maybe, I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's lots of collab possibilities in here in the future. If you guys want that to talk so about things, you keep me, keep me posted. I'm sure we could get you on poker news when your book comes out. We will definitely get your, get articles, all, all the full nine. You guys definitely want to check it out. His and her herspoker.com. I'm Sarah Herring. Thank you guys so much. I could have, that interview could have gone on for ages. I'm telling you, like they, I just, though, for me, that's the kind of people that I can learn from. You know, we've got Jane Andes coming on next week and he's just so fantastic and so brilliant. He's so next level. But for me, I'm like, I need people who like six months ago were playing one, two, <laughs> not both of them, but you they, know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. They've, they've started to take poker super seriously and I, I love that like these are two people who just genuinely love the game yeah. and they said it in their car rides to and from the casino they're talking about hands i mean they probably have much more to discuss as a, as a married couple in life and they're just talking about poker all the time because they love it so much and again like we discussed i, I think so many listeners are either making the transition from one two to two five or just jumping into the live mix and one two action. And I think I think these two are just just great to learn from. Totally, totally. And just fun. And I, you know what I love too about their podcast, and this is something we've talked about with a lot of different people. There's so many different types of content that people are looking for. And yeah. you know, the poker news podcast is long as balls. Let's get real. It's really <laughs> long. We talk for ages. And you know, their podcasts are really short, tight, consumable. You could probably scoop them on your way to work, you know, on the way home, the next one and, and get through, I think they have 20 something episodes at this point. You could, you could binge it in, in a couple of weeks and, and I'm sure your, your poker game would thank you for it. Um, <laughs> and, and honestly, it's, it's easy to binge because they're just going over hands. Yeah. Mainly that's the main part of their podcast. So if you want to listen to a ton of different hand analysis, just boom, 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 get through all their episodes. Oh, that's, I mean, I need this. Uh, I wanted to, to give a couple couple other shout outs that we didn't talk about yet, but the um, WSOPC main event champion, Mike Jukic, I'm going, is that what you would go with? Yeah, I think that's a safe assumption. All right, let's just go with it. But what I will say go is if, if you can't see it, he has a beautiful glass of red wine just right on the table for his winter picture. And I feel like that's a really conscious choice because obviously photographers nine times out of 10 are just going to remove everything from the picture that they don't want in there. So I feel like this guy was like, no, dude, I'm celebrating. I want my wine out. And I just say, you know what, Mike, I'll see you in Vegas. Let's get a cocktail. So, so Sarah, you're obviously the wine analyst, not only on this program, but for poker news, maybe for the poker community as a whole. Yes. How nice of a wine glass is that for it's... a casino? Usually you just get, what, a plastic cup? Yes. That looks like a really solid wine glass to me. I'm telling you, it happens occasionally, but hardly ever in a poker room. I think yeah. in Vegas, I had like a real solid collection. I don't know if you guys know, but in Vegas, you can basically just take your wine with you everywhere. It's right. something I'm really missing. I mean, everywhere. Literally take it out of the restaurant into the next restaurant. Um <laughs> But yeah, in the poker room, it's, it's a different game. You're usually getting, you know, like Dixie cups, basically. Yeah. If you're lucky, they give you little sippy cups and, and they want to protect the tables. It looks like a nice table, but Mike, you know, good for you. Celebrate, have yourself a fine glass of red and congratulations. He, this was the horseshoe in Baltimore, by the way. I think I didn't say that, but, um, a 1675 main event. He won just a little more than 165K. We can see there was quite a few, I think, regular grinders in there 
including Alan Kessler. So I'm sure if anything was wrong, we all know about it now. Shout out to, to the chainsaw. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll catch you guys next week. Again, we've got Jay Nandez coming on next week. I've got Scotty Wynn coming up in the next few weeks. I'm going to make Jeff just hit the ground and book a million other awesome guests. And the next thing you know, it, we're going to be 2018 world series of poker. Yes, yes, yes. Here we come. One more shout out since Jeff's going to keep, I, Jeff's probably going to be playing all these events because he's been playing so much on globalpoker.com with 1.25 million in guaranteed cash prizes, including 100,000 for the main event. You don't want to miss the global poker championships rattlesnake open head to globalpoker.com and enter today. And to be fair, Jeff, after what you said, I'm more sold on it now than ever. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Anti Chardonnay coming soon to global poker. Maybe, firing a rattlesnake open event all my free time all my free time here it comes um anyways it was so good it's so good to have you on the show let me know if you guys have more guests i saw a couple of you your responses from last week we got a great response um to to the book to the woman who's dressing up like a man which i do actually really want to talk about um i thought it was an interesting response so hold on guys we will talk about that and we're also going to get at Rec Poker on beginning of June, another podcast that I really like um, that Chad McBean turned us on to as well. In the meantime, though, Mama's got to go get her life together. For Jeff Platt, Sarah Herring, deuces. Also, thank you, Roberto Romero Marino. <laughs>